Last week we talked about the grace of God to the unfaithful. And we tried to emphasize what great desire God has to forgive. And what dramatic, heartbreaking distance a person can go and God still want them to come back. Today, I want to talk about a reaction to God's grace that He expects all of us to have. And that's here in Matthew chapter 18. I appreciate Brother Brad reading this, this passage, which is this parable that Jesus tells here in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 23. But the parable really illustrates, it's really Jesus' story to explain the principle that He gives us earlier. And I think we'll get more out of this parable. I think it'll be more meaningful to us if we back up and, and see sort of what's going on in this chapter, and then we'll get into the details of the principle and the parable itself. In verse 1, the disciples are, I don't know if arguing is the right word, but they're discussing who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, or who's going to be the greatest once Jesus uses His mighty power to bring the whole world into submission. And so they're talking about who among these close associates of Jesus is going to get the highest position. Who's going to have the best place? Who's going to have the most power and authority? And Jesus rebukes them and He calls a child to Himself. And we remember what He says about becoming little children. Then in verse 7, Jesus starts talking about stumbling blocks. Jesus starts talking to the people about the danger of causing other people to sin. And woe to you who cause even these little children to sin. And what He's really emphasizing is the importance of those the world sees as unimportant. Very much following up on the discussion about who is the greatest. And then you come down to verse 12, and he makes the same or a similar point in a different way where he talks about the farmer who leaves his 99 sheep to find the one sheep that's gone astray. And he's emphasizing again the importance of the individual. The importance of each single soul. And then in verse 15, he talks about when somebody sins against you. When somebody does something that's sinful that hurts you. And how you're supposed to go to them in private. And then if that doesn't work, you go to them uh, with a witness. Uh, and so it goes. And that's really focused on serious infractions. It's not every, uh, every kind of frustration or, or thing that you wish somebody hadn't done. It's, it's for a legitimate, significant sin where I think Jesus teaches us to do that. And then in verse 21, Peter comes with a follow-up question to going to your brother and, and asking him to repent. And he says if he repents, then forgive him. And Peter wants to know, just how far does that principle go? Just how far do you really want us to carry this forward, Jesus, when you say, if, if he repents, forgive him? Verse 21, Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? The rabbis said three times. Peter's going to double it and add some. He's seven times. Peter said, I'm, I'm sure, Jesus, you want us to be magnanimous. You want us to be charitable. You want us to have a long patience. So, so we're, seven, is that about right? Think about what's included in Peter's question. Peter's question implies that we keep a scorecard. 
Peter's question implies that we know the exact number of times that a person has sinned. Because we're keeping up. Because we're making sure we don't miss any. Jesus says to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. So Jesus says, you know what? A scorecard's not going to do it. You need an entire spreadsheet. No, that's not what Jesus is really saying. And that's what he illustrates with the parable. Jesus tells us with the parable that even if it were seven times, once you forgive him the first time and he sins against you, it's the first time again. You never get past one once you forgive because your forgiveness is repeated over and over again. And so, to illustrate his point that he's not really saying 490 times is the limit and, and you keep counting and, and you, you tell the person, now once you get to 385, you better start slowing down because you're getting close. That's not what he says. He says, let me tell you a story about a king. A king comes to settle accounts with his slaves. The word slave here is doulos, general Greek word for subordinate or servant. Now we're not talking about a landowner, we're not talking about a farmer, we're talking about a king. Sometimes in Jesus' parables, you're talking about the master of the house, the owner of the house, the owner of the vineyard. Here you're not talking about the owner of the vineyard. You're talking about a king. And so when you're talking about a servant, you may be talking about a slave, somebody who is bought and sold by the king, but everybody in a king's domain is his servant. And so you could be talking about a duke or an earl or a prince or whatever English title there might be that, that we could use to analogize to the way the kingship and dominion th of things would have worked 2,000 years ago. It doesn't necessarily mean, and according to the details of the parable, almost certainly can't mean, a slave. It means a subordinate or a subject. Jesus says in verse 24 that one of his servants owed him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents is an, unbelievable, an unbelievably large amount of money. And what this really illustrates is that this servant somehow owes the king a completely unpayable sum. Now, if we roll this forward to modern day money, I can, I'll do the math for you. A talent... And if you, uh, if you imagine the way things worked 2,000 years ago and long, longer, then what you would have is you would have a pile of gold, gold coins, silver coins, or some other precious substance, maybe a spice, uh, maybe ivory, or something like that, but something that was important. You put it on this side of the scale, and you put a weight on this side of the scale. Well, a talent was a weight that you put on one side of the scale and you put the gold or the silver or whatever on the other side of the scale until it balanced out that weight. Well, the talent weight is 75 pounds. It's about the heaviest weight that they use. And so what you're talking about, if you're talking about gold, you're talking about 75 pounds of gold in one talent. I looked up the price of gold yesterday, and the price of gold at the end of this week, July 13, 2019, was $1,410 per ounce. Now there's 16 ounces in a pound, there's 75 pounds in a talent. So one talent of gold, 75 pounds of gold today, is... $1,692,000. Okay? That's one talent. This servant owed 10,000 
talents. So if this were real money today, that would be 16.92 billion dollars. 16 billion 920 million dollars. And so you see, he's talking about an extraordinary sum. Maybe it's not gold. Maybe it's silver. Well, if silver in modern day usage, uh, silver closed at $15.20 an ounce. So if he's talking about silver, he's only talking about $182,400,000. Even if it's silver, he owes him $182,000,000. But this is really misleading because the word Jesus used here that's translated into all of our Bibles as 10,000 doesn't actually mean 10,000. The word is myrioi. And it is the plural of the word that comes through and is transliterated into English, myriad. You see this word used in Revelation. There are myriads upon myriads of angels. Well, here it's myriads, plural, of talents. And so what Jesus is really saying here is that it's an uncountable sum of money. We might say it today as a gazillion dollars or a jillion bazillion or something like that. Jesus says... So he's got a servant who owes him a gazillion dollars and he comes to settle accounts with his slave. That's what he's really saying. He's saying this is an absolutely unpayable sum. Psalm 53, verse 1. David is pouring out his heart in sorrow over his own sin. David is feeling the weight of his mistakes. He says in verse 3, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 15 of Matthew 18, Jesus says, If your brother sins against you. But the Bible also teaches in several places, like Psalm 51, that every sin is also against God. And so when he tells this parable and he's talking about talents, he's not talking about money debt, he's talking about moral debt. He's talking about debt owed to God. Every sin. And the way God sees it, the way God sees it is that every person owes Him a gazillion billion dollars of sin. Every person has built up this giant debt in the bank of wrath that is just sin after sin after sin. And that's what we see in the story of Gomer and Hosea. That's what we saw last week in the story of Hosea and Gomer. But that's not Jesus' point. And His point is not even the point that was made in Hosea and Gomer. Verse 25 also echoes the same idea. Verse 25 says... But since he did not have the means to repay, obviously he doesn't have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayments to be made. So the king says, all right, buddy, you're done. You're now really going to become a slave and I'll take what I can get and not worry about when you're going to pay me. Verse 26. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. 
that reminds us of how God treated the Israelites and the people of Judah. It reminds us of how Hosea treated Gomer. And it should remind us how God treats us. He has compassion. He knows we can't pay the debt. But if we fall prostrate and we beg for mercy, if we make ourselves completely submissive in, rea- in recognition of the reality that our debt is unpayable, He'll have compassion. He is a God of grace, which is illustrated by this king. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's what's illustrated by this statement where Jesus says the king felt compassion. He felt compassion for this servant, for this slave. Our God is a God of compassion. But the real point of the story in Matthew 18 is how the slave, how the servant, responds to the compassion. How the servant responds to the mercy. Verse 28, That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a talent is six hundred denarii. This servant is owed by somebody else one hundred denarii. A little over three months wages. The first one owed 10,000 times 600. This one owes 100. And so he goes to somebody who owes him money at the end of verse 28. And he seized him and began to choke him. Literally grabs him around the throat and threatens his life. And says, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, Have patience with me and I'll repay you. Same thing that the bigger debtor owed. Bigger debtor did. He fell to the ground and begged for time. Verse 30, But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. The servant who was forgiven the 10,000 talents or the myriad of talents, myriads of talents, doesn't adopt the master's attitude. He doesn't adopt the master's view of how people should be treated. And instead, he throws a man into prison over a small debt. Here's Jesus' point. When Peter says, how many times does somebody have to... how many times do I have to forgive a person until I don't have to forgive anymore. Jesus says, what you're being asked to forgive is so much smaller than what you're asking God to forgive. How dare you ask the question? How dare you ask the question, what is the limit on the forgiveness that I have to give? Jesus says, do you want God to put a limit on the forgiveness that He's willing to give you? That's what the slave didn't understand. Now when the king comes and calls him on the carpet and condemns him for his debt, he feels sorrow. He feels regret, but he only feels the regret of consequences. He only feels the regret of the world. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation but the sorrow of the world produces death. 
The first servant feels sorrow of consequence, but it doesn't change how he treats other people. And so his change is a change in circumstance, but not a change in behavior. And the change in circumstance doesn't last long. You see, Jesus is telling us that holding grudges is just not what we're supposed to do. If you're going to be a forgiven person, you must be a forgiving person. We are not righteous people telling sinners how to be righteous. We are beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. We're not righteous, we're beggars. And when somebody asks us for forgiveness, they're not asking for nearly as much as we've asked somebody else. Or that we should have asked somebody else. The master reacts very negatively to how this servant treats his fellow servant. Verse 31, His fellow slaves saw what had happened. They were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. The people around this servant realize the injustice of what this servant has done and how he's treating other people. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave. And wicked is really not even strong enough to capture the, the thrust of the Greek word here. It is like vile, horrible, evil person. You wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in that same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. So his forgiveness is retracted. You think about that. He received forgiveness. The king says, I'm going to forgive you. And now the king some, comes back and says, Nope, I'm going to punish you. Hands him over to the torturers. It's what Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6. Forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Forgiveness is, continual, is conditional on giving forgiveness. And then Jesus makes the point in a very scary way in verse 35. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. God will punish the unforgiving. People whose lives are not characterized by extending the grace that God has extended to us will be punished. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's what He says very clearly. This punishment will be, will be conscious and unending. But I want you to notice something. This servant is not punished because of his debt. This servant is not punished because of his inability to pay his debt. He's not punished because of his mismanagement of the king's wealth. This servant is punished because of his mismanagement of the king's mercy. He didn't mismanage his assets that led to his punishment. He mismanaged his mercy and that led to his punishment. You see the message that Jesus is bringing. How often do I have to forgive somebody? As often as you want God to forgive you. As often as you want God to forgive you. Brothers and sisters, our lives should be characterized by a desire to forgive. When a person sins against us, we should have the firm and committed hope of forgiveness. A desire that they will be forgiven, not only by us, but by God. Amen. And so the way we treat people will be affected by that. 
the way we talk to people, the way we talk about people, will be affected by our desire to give the grace to others that God has given to us. If you haven't received the forgiveness that God makes available, we hope you'll respond to His grace today. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you need to put Him on in baptism, being united with Him in the likeness of His death, having your sins washed away, if you need to return to Christ, if you need the prayers of the church, whatever your need, please come down front as we stand and sing.